Vibrant, vibrant, vibrant music teaching. Proven and practical tips, strategies, and ideas for music teachers. You're listening to the Vibrant Music Teaching Podcast. I'm Nicola Canton, and in today's episode, we're talking about how to teach technique to piano students. You can find the accompanying article that goes along with this episode at vibrantmusicteaching.com slash 158 or if you're not a member, colorfulkeys.ie slash 158. Hey there, beautiful teachers. Welcome back to the Vibrant Music Teaching Podcast. And if you're new, welcome to your first episode. So when I was naming this episode and the blog post, I did ask a few members of the team about the title because I was worried it might be a bit of an Irishism. I still kind of think it probably is, or at least it's a UK and Ireland thing, I think, to say the lads. But I was assured that people would understand what I meant. So it's called How to Teach Piano Technique Without Hannon and the Lads. What do I mean by without Hannon and the lads? I said the lads because I mean... Oh, well, all the usual suspects, the Hannon, the Cherney, and the like. Yes, they're all very different in what they compose, but I'm lumping them into one category because they're often used in piano lessons in the same way. So before we go any further, I want to clear something up. This episode is about technique, teaching technique. That is different from Hannon and scales and arpeggios and chord patterns and many other things which people often call technique, which I call technical exercises. Now, I feel like I sometimes go off on a bit of a lecture about this or something, or I get sucked into pedantry, but I do think this distinction is important because it's something that really made a difference when I finally realised it in my own playing as a student. At some point, maybe age, I don't know, late teens, certainly after I'd already started teaching, is when I suddenly realised that I hadn't really been taught much technique. Because technique should be about how you physically play. This is all my opinion, of course, but this is how I define it. Technique is how you move your body to play the piano. And too often, and certainly in my experience as a student, we're taught technical exercises and it's called technique without us being instructed how to play the technical exercises. In which case, they're not technique at all. We can play them with great technique or with terrible technique. We can play in ways that cause ourselves injuries or are efficient. But if we haven't been instructed on how to play them, then they're just series of notes like any other. And they happen to be series of notes that many students don't particularly want to play, right? I mean, maybe some people find hand and patterns inspiring to listen to, but I don't really, and I don't think a lot of students do. So I wanted to get that cleared up right up front, what I mean by technique, so that we can differentiate between those two things. I am not saying technical exercises, including Hannon and Cherney and Scales, don't have their place, but we're going to put them off to the side, put a pin in them over there on the clipboard, whatever you want to imagine in your mind. Put them over there and we'll come back to them later, okay? Let's talk about technique. We're going to start without any piano. One really useful part of teaching technique for me and something I've seen make a huge difference in my students, is integrating a warm-up routine. This is a physical series of exercises and stretches that we do before we play anything, before we even sit down or as we're sitting down at the piano. This is so that we can set ourselves up with good posture and relaxed muscles. Some people quibble about the word relax because for some students it can mean like loose or completely without holding yourself up (laughs) but that's not what I mean by relaxed I just mean free from tension okay so tension free movement at the piano is really what we want we don't want to be collapsing but 
more students tend the other way and they have too much tension in their body. So to be able to move with freedom, to be able to play efficiently, I think we need to become more aware of our bodies and how we're sitting. And we need to relax our bodies and get used to the different body parts that we're about to use in the piano. And this is where a simple warm-up routine can be really effective for students of literally any age. Here's a sequence you might use. So start by reaching down to the floor. Touch your toes if you can touch your toes. Reach down to the floor. And then roll back up slowly, stacking the spine. Vertebra by vertebra. Then swing your arms around by your sides. I call this knocking on heaven's door, but it just means flopping your arms by your sides like they're heavy spaghetti, right? Then rolling your shoulders and wrists, and then sitting down at the bench. So we've done all that standing up, now we sit down at the bench, we plant one foot and then the other. I like to do this quite intentionally, just don't know if you can hear that on the mic, but (laughs) planting one foot and then the other, so they're firmly rooted, because those are part of your tripod, right, sitting at the piano. And then lean backwards and forwards on the bench and come to that midway point where you feel like you're grounded and sitting up tall. And then lift your hands to touch the keys. Literally just place them on top of the keys, gently, rounded hand shape, and then lift them and put them back in your lap. I like to do this to build the muscle memory in my students for how they start a piece, that they lift their hands with intentionality up to the keys and how they finish a piece, crucially lifting them off, up gracefully. Hopefully you can picture that in your mind's eye and back down onto the lap. We've all seen those concert performances from our students, right? Where they just finish the last note and they're getting up while completing that last chord and walking away from the piano. So this is just the beginning of practicing that proper completion of a piece or proper endings. Okay, so that's six steps. You've got the roll up, roll down, swinging your arms, rolling your shoulders and wrists, sitting down on the bench and planting the feet, leaning backwards and forwards to find the midway point where you are sitting up tall and your spine feels supported and at the center point of gravity, and then lifting your hands up to touch the keys and back down into your lap. It doesn't have to be those six things. You can add on, you can take away, you can do your own things, right? I have lots of different versions of this routine and I really like experimenting with it. But some version of that helps us to come into our bodies, notice that we're about to do something physical. Because I don't know about you, but I didn't really think about piano as a physical act for a long time, right? It can be really tiring. It is a physical movement. Yes, they're smaller movements, it's not like we're running about the place, but it is a physical thing. And so we need to warm up like we would for exercise. So it helps us come into our body, become aware of those different body parts, and release some of that tension. Another useful part of setting yourself with a up without tension is some kind of deep breathing. I really loved how Christina Whitlock put this in her Beyond Measure podcast on an episode a few months ago. I'm going to put a link in the article. But it was her episode about performances, performance anxiety specifically. And she talked about a mentor of hers or a professor of hers, I think it was, who had said that their goal was to associate the piano with relaxation. Again, listen to Christina talk about it, but this is my interpretation of it. So associating the piano with relaxation rather than we sit down and we launch straight into a piece and therefore associated with feeling nervous and unsure of ourselves and wanting to perform events and all these things that imply tension. How about we sit down and our first act at the piano is always three deep slow breaths. Because then we start to, over time, slowly and slowly, associate sitting down at the piano with a relaxed state of being. So just three deep breaths in and out. And I would count for your students with this. So inhale one, two, three, exhale one, two, three. Or you can use words like we inhale Mississippi, 
B or whatever you want to do. Maybe Mississippi's confusing since people use that as a measure of a second, but anyway. <laughs> Some way to regulate the breathing. It really makes a huge difference. I mean, it sounds like such a silly thing. Oh, just take deep breaths or it sounds almost hokey, right? But it really makes a difference. Have you ever tried this when you're stressed and you're trying to go to sleep? Just focus back on your breathing and start counting those breaths and slowing them down and slowing them down. It's amazing the physical effect something that forced can have on your body. And speaking of relaxation and stretches, another good thing to integrate into your lessons is yoga and Pilates moves. Now, what you actually use from yoga and Pilates will depend on the student, but I would tend to turn to some of the tools that I have from both of those things. I do both of those myself, and I would turn to some of those stretches or practices or breathing exercises to help students with maybe extra needs in this area. So students who have a lot of tension in their shoulders or who carry themselves very hunched over would mean one set of yoga exercises. Or, you know, students with various different issues, students who play with a lot of tension, especially some of my students who have DCD or something like that. That's just something to explore, I'd say, if you need extra help. And I certainly think it could be useful to ask or have your student go see a physio just for one session to get a prescribed set of exercises if they are having trouble with a lot of tension in a certain area, especially your older students. Many physios, at least here, will turn to Pilates moves, like they'll prescribe certain moves and I'm like, oh, they're from Pilates, although they may not say them like that. Or you can go to a Pilates consultant as well. A lot of them are also physios and stuff like that. That's an extra area to look into, though, for sure. Okay, so that's the setup. That's the warm-up routine and the associated stretches. And I think that stuff is underutilized by us as piano teachers. Let's get into the actual playing technique, shall we? There are two sides to this for me, two ways of looking at technique. There's the artistic, imaginative, descriptive, flowery language way, and there's the specific, mechanical, anatomical way. And when I said those, described those two, you may have a had an immediate reaction towards or against one or the other. Maybe you did, maybe you didn't, but I know many teachers sway strongly in one direction there. As a student, I had all teachers who swayed the first way. Flowery, descriptive, focusing on the music, just talking about the sound, and trying to tell your body to come up with that sound. Almost. And I think I really could have benefited from more of the other way. The mechanics, all of that stuff, like physically telling me how I need to move my body in order to achieve those sounds. Maybe part of the reason for that is, I mean, it's my brain and the way I function, and I do tend to be quite analytical about things, but I also think it's maybe the hypermobility I have in my joints that I need to be told, specifically move your wrist this much this direction at first and see another person do it in slow motion because otherwise I will I'll hyperextend all over the place right there's very little boundaries in my body so I can do the craziest things and so yeah I think it's partially both of those but whichever direction you tend as a student and as a teacher I want you to consider including the other one because I think they're both useful tools, and I think they should be used in parallel. Not just because one student will suit one or the other. It's not about latching on to one or the other for each individual student either. I think approaching them from both sides, approaching technique from both sides, is where you'll really get the strongest understanding and most efficient use of their body and preventing air injury and all the things that we want. And beautiful music, right? So. With that in mind, let's talk about those two sides a little bit so that you can rebalance if you do sway one way or the other, okay? When I talk about specific instructions, I do mean things like, okay, at the end of your slurs, lift your wrist upwards and towards the fall board and lift about, I don't know, 15 centimeters off the piano. I'm making this stuff up, but literally it could be that specific. 
physically describing it and demonstrating in slow motion and maybe even doing some slow motion videos of your student doing it so that they can start to see the difference and analyze it for themselves. I'm going to talk about sequencing of specific techniques in a second because that is kind of to do with specificity but let's first of all look at the other side. So that's the mechanical description of what is happening. The other side is the imaginative and for that there's kind of a two-pronged approach. Getting your student to focus back on the sound and really understand the sound that they're after. So the tapering sound and tuning their ears into that and lots of listening. And using analogies to make yourself clearer. I would advise that you actually come up with your own analogies. So I'm not going to give you my favorites because honestly the best ones have come from conversation I've had with my student and we come up with it and therefore it means something in my studio, in our vocabulary. I'll give you an example, in case you're not sure what I'm talking about, of a traditional one, let's say, which is the image of staccato being like you touch a hot stove and jump away. Have you heard that one? There's even several cartoon versions out there of a piano teacher and a student sitting at a stove and she's getting him to practice, literally touching the stove to practice his staccato. Obviously not what we're going to do, but even that original analogy, I don't love because, or is it a metaphor? Anyway, whatever. I don't love it because if I was about to reach out to touch a hot stove and I thought it might be hot, even if I'm not sure whether it's hot or not, I'm going to fill my body with tension in anticipation of that hot stove. So I don't love it, but that's one example. So you can come up with these and try different ways to describe it in your studio and see what fits for you. Now. Those are the two sides. Now let's talk about the sequencing. I would describe all of these all along the way in terms of the sound we're looking to create, the mechanics of how they should move their body to play it, and the imagination and the stories and the analogies and the metaphors and the symbolates to go with that. I like to start my students with non-legato playing first. And this is something I really got from a few different people primarily from Piano Safari, which many of you will know I love that method and I use it a lot with my students. But this is also talked about by several other methods, such as the work of Irina Gorin or Irina Mintz. So that's Tales of a Musical Journey and Hello Piano, if you're familiar with them, and their videos if you watch them teaching. They will teach non-legato first as well. When we teach non-legato first, it allows us to use our whole arm to move around the piano and it stops students from having many of those issues that we get later on when we go straight to legato, such as the collapsing fingertips, the wrists too low, the collapsed knuckle bridge, all of those things. They're not alleviated completely if a student has a weakness in a particular area by doing non-legato first, but it does really help to prevent that from most students going forward. After non-legato is truly established and a student is playing with freedom and moving around comfortably, at some stage I will introduce legato. Now Piano Safari splits this up into two types of legato. They have what they would call tree frog and soaring bird. And I'll explain them in my terms, okay? So the tree frog that they have is like this bouncy legato or nudgy legato, where you bounce your arm or your wrist lightly to get from note to note. And then the soaring bird is that smooth legato where you're staying aligned behind one finger, but you're not bouncing the arm up and down to go along. Now, about these, they would have tree frog first, then soaring bird. I do still teach both of those. However, if a student defaults to playing soaring bird style, on the tree frog exercises and they're just not getting the tree frog bounce, I will skip it and, you know, come back to that style of playing if we need it later. But yeah, I'd say it's about almost 50-50 on students who I find that useful for and not. So I just wanted to note that here in case you're in the same boat and worrying something's wrong. That's how I've landed on it. I introduce it. If Soaring Bird seems more useful right away, we'll jump to that. After They have non-legato and legato established, then I'll introduce staccato, and I prefer 
to do that as a full arm staccato bouncing straight up with your whole arm rather than a finger staccato, which we would get to much later. So they're bouncing up from their whole arm. Immediately after you get to the key bed, you're using your whole arm to lift it back up. And I'll demonstrate that a lot for students, showing them how high I'm getting off the keyboard and give them a chance to, to try that because I find most of them want to stay too close. And so I really have to point, like, pause myself in midair and say, look at this distance, you know, it's like 20 centimeters or something. Look at that. That's how high I want you to get your hand. And if they're really struggling with that, I will hold my hand over the top of theirs so that they have to jump up to it or hold a ruler up there or something like that. After that, I will get to the slurs and phrasing. So I'll start with the slur endings. I think those are really important and not teaching them early enough is a mistake I've made myself, certainly, and that I've seen in transfer students where they get to, you know, late intermediate at early advanced a level and they really do not perform slurs. <laughs> I mean, they're not lifting the ends of slurs and they have to learn it and backtrack there and we can get there, but it takes a lot of going over to really get that smooth and graceful. And then the final stage in this beginner level would be to shape the phrases, right? Adding what I call micro dynamics in my studio. Because, again, just saying, oh, okay, make it sound like it's singing, or these things sound very nice, and they can be great for some students, but some of them will need more specifics, okay? This is the most important note in the phrase. We're going to do like a micro crescendo and a micro diminuendo to and away from that important note is one way I would talk about it. You need to have lots of these different ways of describing things so that your student gets the whole picture. That is just the beginning stages. After that, I'd be tending towards teaching through repertoire and teaching things as they come up. So my students, as they go through their studies, they have the basic articulation in place. They go through logical sequence of repertoire, depending on their tastes and their interests and their goals. And as things come up, that's when we'll work on various techniques going forward from there. And we will sometimes take out bits of those pieces and make them into almost exercises. But I still don't tend to use a lot of Hand and the lads, right? Even going forward. In those beginning stages, I will be doing rope pieces as well to work on integrating a lot of these techniques and making them really solid. So, pieces where you don't have to read are really great for that because you can focus on the technique because you're not reading. It's one less thing for your brain to do. And then gradually that goes into more just reading pieces over time. Don't do a lot of rote past the beginning stages with most students. So it'll be things from their repertoire, from pieces they want to learn anyway, because that's what I think is the most motivating. You want to learn to play this piece. You learn that you need wrist rotation and whatever to play this effectively. You need a certain way of playing. And so you learn to do that through the piece and because of the piece, because of that motivation. A later stage, I might start to introduce more etudes. And it depends on the student, of course. But as a general rule, most of my students wouldn't start doing books of standard etudes or wouldn't be prescribing them without a specific reason until they're getting to that late intermediate, early advanced, grade six, seven, eight stage. Because at that stage, they're going to have bigger, more ambitious pieces in general, and they need those few weak pieces. So weak as in W-E-E-K, as in shorter time frame pieces that they can learn quickly, that they can get through a lot of, so that they're keeping up their reading skills and, yes, meeting lots of different techniques. Still, Hannon is not my favorite there. I prefer Czerny. I prefer compilation mixes where there's some Bergmuller, some Czerny, some different things included in there. So that is a broad overview of technique. It's an ambitious topic to cover in one episode here, but I wanted to do it in this way so that you could get an overview of what I mean by technique and how you might teach it and why you might include some things in a certain order. 
and I hope it was useful for you. Do let me know whether you found this useful, whether you needed to listen several times to catch everything I was saying, or whether it was a good pace for you, and what ways you teach technique. I'd love to hear from you in the comments underneath this episode. It's at vibrantmusicteaching.com slash 158 for members or colourfulkeys.ie slash 158 for non-members. And I'd love to hear from you there or in the Facebook group, Vibrant Music Studio Teachers. See you there, guys. Vibrant Music Teaching membership costs less than the price of one lesson each month. That is totally worth it for all of the courses, games, resources, downloadables, printables that you can get access to as a member as well as the fabulous community support you'll find inside. Go to vmt.ninja and become part of the revolution.